Victorian Periodical Parade. Chapter 5. Incident of the Letter It was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was at once admitted by Pole and carried down by the kitchen offices and across a yard which had once been a garden to the building which was indifferently known as the laboratory or the dissecting rooms. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon, and his own taste being rather chemical than anatomical had changed the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. It was the first time that the lawyer had been received in that part of his friend's quarters, and he eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity, and gazed round with a distasteful sense of strangeness. As he crossed the theatre, once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemistry apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw, and the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. At the further end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red baize, and through this Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room fitted round with glass presses, furnished, among other things, with a cheval, a glass, and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. A fire burned in the grate. A lamp was set lighted on the chimney shelf, for even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly, and there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deadly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. And now, said Mr. Utterson, as soon as Pole had left them, you have heard the news. The doctor shuddered. They were crying in the square, he said. I heard them in my dining room. One word, said the lawyer. Garu was my client, but so are you, and I want to know what I am doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow. Hutterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor, I swear to God I will never set eyes upon him again, and I bind my honor to you that I am done with him in this world. It is all at an end, and indeed he does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe. He is quite safe. Mark my words, he will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He did not like his friend's feverish manner. You seem pretty sure of him, he said, and for your sake I hope you may be right. If it came to a trial, your name might appear. I am quite sure of him, replied Jekyll. I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone, but there is one thing on which you may advise me. I have, have received a letter and I'm at a loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I am sure. I have so great a trust in you. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detection, asked the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say that I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. I was thinking of my own character, which this hateful business has rather exposed. Utterson remained a while. He was surprised at his friend's selfishness, and yet relieved by it. Well, he said at last, let me see the letter. The letter was written in odd, upright hand and signed, Edward Hyde. It signified briefly enough that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had long so unworthily repaid for a thousand generosities, need labor under no alarm for his safety, as he had means of escape on which he placed a sure dependence. The lawyer liked this letter well enough, and put a better color on the intimacy than he had looked for, and he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. Have you the envelope? he asked. I burned it, replied Jekyll, before I thought what I was about, but it bore no postmark. The note was handed in. Shall I keep this and sleep upon it? asked Utterson. I wish you to judge for me entirely, was the reply. I have lost confidence in myself. Well, I shall consider, returned the lawyer. And now one more word. 
It was Hyde who dictated the terms in your will about that disappearance. The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You have had a fine escape. I have had what is far more to the purpose, returned the doctor solemnly. I have had a lesson. Oh, God, Utterson, what a lesson I have had. And he covered his face for a moment with his hands. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word or two with Pole. By the by, said he, there was a letter handed in today. What was the messenger like? But Pole was positive nothing had come except by post. And only circulars by that, he added. This news sent off the visitor with his fears renewed. Plainly the letter had come by laboratory door. Possibly, indeed, it had been written in the cabinet. And if that was so, it must be differently judged and handled with more caution. The newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the footsteps. Special edition! Shocking murder of an MP! That was the funeral oration of one friend and client, and he could not help a certain apprehension lest the good name of another should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. It was at least a ticklish decision that he had to make, and self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. It was not to be had directly, but perhaps, he thought, it might be fished for. Presently, after he sat on the side of his own hearth with Mr. Guest, his head clerk, upon the other in midway between at a nicely calculated distance from the fire, a bottle of a particular old wine that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of his house, the fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city, where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles, and through the muffle and smother of these fallen clouds, the procession of the town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries with the sound of a mighty wind. But the room was gay with firelight. In the bottle, the acids were long ago resolved, and the imperial dye was softened with time. As the color grows richer in stained windows, and the glow of hot autumn afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free, and to disperse the fogs of London, insensibly the lawyer melted. There was no man from whom he kept fewer secrets than Mr. Guest, and he was not always sure that he kept as many as he meant. Guest had often been on business to the doctors. He knew Pole. He could scarce have failed to hear of Mr. High's familiarity about the house. He might draw conclusions. Was it not as well, then, that he should see a letter which put that mystery to rights? And above all, Guest, being a great student and critic of handwriting, could consider the step natural and obliging. The clerk, besides, was a man of counsel. He would scarce read so strange a document without dropping a remark. And by that remark, Mr. Utterson might shape his future course. This is a sad business about Sir Danvers, he said. Yes, sir, indeed. It has elicited a great deal of public feeling, returned Guest. The man, of course, was mad. I should like to hear your views on that, replied Utterson. I have a document here in his handwriting. It is between ourselves, for I scarce know what to do about it. It is an ugly business at the best, but there it is, quite in your way, a murderer's autograph. Guest's eyes brightened, and he sat down at once and studied it with passion. No, sir, he said, not mad, but it is in very odd hand. And by all accounts a very odd writer, added the lawyer. Just then the servant entered with a note. Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir? inquired the clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Only an invitation to dinner. Why, do you want to see it? One moment. I thank you, sir, said the clerk, and laid the two sheets of paper alongside, and sedulously compared their contents. Thank you, sir, he said at last, returning both. It's a very interesting autograph. There was a pause during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. Why did you compare them, guest? he inquired suddenly. Well, sir, returned the clerk, there's a rather singular resemblance. The two hands are in many points identical, only 
differently sloped. Rather quaint, said Utterson. It is, as you say, rather quaint, returned Guest. I wouldn't speak of this note, you know, said the master. No, sir, said the clerk. I understand. But no sooner was Mr. Utterson alone that night than he locked the note into his safe, where it reposed from that time forward. What, he thought, Henry Jekyll forge for a murderer? And his blood ran cold in his veins. <laughs> Victorian Periodical Parade Victorian Periodical Parade